church. Good to see everybody today. It is good to be together, whether you are with us virtually or you are with us in person. We are together in the house of the Lord, and for that we are grateful. Good for me to be back. <clears throat> I've enjoyed a little bit of time away. Went to visit our meet my newest grandson in London, Silas, and had a great time. And if um, unless I'm being catfished, uh, Cheryl is in the air coming back from London as I speak. So uh, I know it's been three months and there's been a lot of rumors about whether Cheryl was ever coming back. So, <clears throat> and I think I started those rumors. So, uh, <laughs> so we'll see. But uh, if uh, unless I again like, you know, unless I'm catfished, we'll uh, we'll we'll reunite in Norfolk tonight. So good things. I want to welcome Andrea Boudra, who's with us on the organ today. So it's great to see you, Andrea. Thanks for being thanks for being part of our family today. And I want to encourage you to do one thing as you get ready for worship. Go ahead and get your Bibles open. John chapter 13. John chapter 13. We'll come to that a little bit later, but it would just be great for us to, uh, to have that ready for us. Our call to worship comes from the Gospel of John. Believe in the light while you have the light, so that you may become children of light. Sisters and brothers, let us worship our God.
please be seated. Friends, if we say we have no sin, the truth does not dwell within us. So let us confess our sin to our loving and grace-filled God by using the prayer of confession, which is found in our bulletins. Let us pray. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. We are not always that willing to love one another, especially when others have wronged us for whatever reason. We hold brothers rather than confront our aggressors. We talk about them rather than to them. As Judas betrayed Jesus, we continue to deceive the risen Christ. Forgive our reluctance to humble ourselves and wash us anew with the waters of new life. mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. In the name of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Obeying the word of our Lord Jesus and certain of his promises, we baptize those whom God has called to be his own. We know that by baptism, God puts a sign, a seal, a mark, a guarantee on our lives, a promise of his presence in our earthly living, and a promise of his presence as we abide with him eternally in the heavens. And it's by baptism that we welcome into the family of God new believers. And so as we come today, Whitney and Brian, I'm going to ask you these questions. Is Jesus your Lord and Savior? Do you trust in him? Do you intend to use the means of grace to raise your child in the faith? And do you desire that she be baptized? Might the congregation be upstanding? Our Lord Jesus Christ ordered us to teach those who are baptized. Do you, the people of the church, promise to tell this precious new disciple the good news of the gospel, to help her know all that Christ commands, and by your fellowship to strengthen her family ties with the household of God? If so, please answer, we do. Father, we thank you and praise you for this day and for your presence with us. We pray that your spirit would come and rest upon this child and this family so that your promises would be claimed each and every day of her living. We pray this in the beautiful, majestic name of our Savior Jesus. Amen. Please be seated.
So what is the Christian name of this child? Magnolia Catherine. I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come on, sweetie. Oh, thank you. Okay. We're going to walk around. Do you know what's going to happen? Your sisters are going to sing. You want to watch? Watch this. Maria and Michaela are up there with Marissa. You want to sing? Jesus loves me. connected and some really exciting things happen in the midst of our church. So Belina, you're going to start. I'm, I'm stepping on you today and I apologize for it. <laughs> I took part of that and I wasn't supposed to. It's okay. Okay, thank you. You want to just keep, keep going? No, no, no. I don't want to. I'll pay for it later, so please just go on. <laughs> <laughs> so we want to encourage you to get connected um, by using, if you're here with us in the sanctuary, you received an envelope. We want you to fill that out. Um, there's a place for prayer requests. If you check, co check confidential, only Jim and I will see those. And it's an honor and privilege for us to, to pray for you and with you. And if you don't check confidential, our prayer ministers, our elders and deacons pray over these in the next 48 hours. If you're online with us, we're so glad that you're here. There's a connection card there for you to click on. Let us know you're here. And also the prayer requests are the same. Check confidential, only Jim Wood and I will see those. Or... Um, our elders, deacons, and prayer ministers will see those. So good to be together. Great, thanks. Uh, so great things in the summer as opportunities for you. So great reads. Uh, we've got a great devotional guide for you to read through the Gospel of John in the summer. So I would really encourage you to pick that up. They're available here at the Welcome Desk. We'd love for you to do that. We also are doing a Bob Goff's Love Always as a congregation this summer. You can order that book online now. That's easily done. You can get it in a day or two um, on Amazon. So easily easily gotten and there's a study guide that Lynn has put together for it that you can pick up here at the welcome desk and it is again another great great opportunity for us to be able to be connected today is the deadline if you are going to Massanetta with us on our family mission trip it is the 5th through the 8th of August it is absolutely great for all ages all kinds of things to do fun work all of that Again, today's the deadline, so just let us know. And then FPC 101, a great way if you've been worshiping with us um, in person or virtually, and you want to know more about the congregation, you want to meet the staff, kind of see what we believe, all of those things, that is on Sunday, the 29th of August from 3 to 7. So we would love for you to be part of that, just let KC know. Great, great things happening in our midst. As we move into a time of prayer, we want to continue to lift up our entire world for peace, for, for um, reconciliation, not only in our country, but in every country. We also want to lift up those who are suffering with great loss, those who are stepping into to difficult situations as they, they support family and friends. And we also want to lift up those who are facing um, surgery and recovering from it. Um, so Folks, in particular, we want to pray for uh, Chris McKinnon Hing, who has been transferred from Jefferson Hospital in Philadelphia to the Moss Center for Continued Rehabilitation. So prayers for her, 
for her husband, Zach, and her entire family. Also prayers for Silas Smith-Wood, um, the Wood's youngest grandson, uh, who will be having a doctor's appointment tomorrow. So prayers for Silas, for, for Ross and Andrea as they move forward in his care. And we also want to um, continue to praise the work that is being done at the center, the old Greyhound station downtown, and the guests that are received there and the ways that we can be the hands and feet of Christ. And we encourage you to continue to celebrate that partnership and volunteer for slots that are open. We received, let's see, 87 prayer requests through our connection cards last week, prayers for family and friends, health issues, and folks requesting healing and seven praise reports. Another wonderful thing to note today at the 10 o'clock service, we are commissioning um, Susan Brown Giraud, who's the daughter of uh, long-term, uh, lifelong missionaries, um, Dr. Richard and Judith Brown. Um, she will be commissioned at the 10 o'clock service to go to the Congo. Um, she will be a staff member on a hospital there, and so we are so excited for her future and the ways that the Lord will be using her. So let us pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you and praise you for the gift of this day, for the opportunity that we have, Lord, to sing of your praises and to proclaim your good news. We pray, Lord, that as we continue to worship, that your Holy Spirit would come abide among us. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege of baptism, and we thank you for Magnolia Catherine and for the wisdom and, and, um, and privilege of, of being with her on this day and with her family, Lord. We pray an extra ounce of your guidance and, and of your discernment as she grows in wisdom and knowledge of you. We thank you for the gift of walking with those who are in need of your presence and love. And so we pray, Lord, that, that you would, that your presence would shine brightly in us as we reach out to others in need of your care and in need of your presence and of your support. We lift our lives to you, Lord, and pray that um, you would be with, with those who are um, encountering doctor's appointments and surgeries and we pray lord that that you would have your hand of healing upon all those who are seeking it we lift our voices to you lord as we pray our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come Director for Family Ministry here. Um, I'm here doing the children's sermon. I'm going to invite Jonah and Eli to come up here with me. I asked them before, so they're not getting called out. Good morning, guys. If you guys want to sit on either side of me here, I'll move over. All right. So can you? And yes, Miss Eleanor, you want to come up here too? Here, you sit right here. All right, so can you guys tell me your uh, name and how old you guys are? I'm Eli, and I'm 10. Jonah, and I'm one year younger than Eli. <laughs> Some math for you guys. Eleanor Catherine Cantillos. How old are you, Eleanor? Six and a half. Six and a half, okay. So I got a question for you guys. What is the first thing that you do before you sit down to eat dinner? Wash your hands. Yeah, wash your hands. So because our hands get really dirty, right? So we need to wash them before coming to the table. So what are some ways your hands can get dirty? Mud. Yeah, mud. You guys have some other ways your hands get dirty? Petting our dog. Yeah, that's a good one. Playing outside. Yeah, playing outside, petting your dog, yeah. So now, we know our hands get dirty, but now I want you to imagine the dirtiest, crustiest, grossest feet that you can think of. What kind of things would make your feet dirty? Dust. Yeah, dust could make your feet dirty. What else? Mud. Yeah, mud. Any 
ideas? No, but yeah, dust and mud. Sometimes if you're walking with like open shoes or sandals, kind of like my sandals, see like that? That can make your feet dirty. So how dirty do you think your feet would get if you were walking on a dusty, dirty road for a really long time? Um, an hour. Yeah, for an hour. How dirty would your feet get? A lot. A lot. Really dirty, yeah. That would be really bad, but it would be even worse if you were sharing the road with animals and donkeys because you might even step in some animal dung. Doesn't that seem pretty gross? Yeah, you, right? Now imagine that it was somebody's job to wash feet like that. Do you think that would be a great job to have? No. No? Do you think that would be a fun job to have? Yeah. Yeah, you would like that job? <laughs> Washing some animal dung off people's feet? You would like that? So in Bible times, washing someone's feet that was not usually a fun job, and usually a servant did that. But in the Bible story that you're going to hear today, Jesus and his disciples, they were sharing a meal together when Jesus decided to get up, and he washed his disciples' feet. So even though Jesus was the disciples' teacher and the Son of God, he served his disciples by washing their feet, even though they were dirty and smelly. Why do you guys think Jesus would do that? Yeah, because Jesus is nice. And yeah, Jesus washed the disciples' feet to teach them that they needed to serve other people. So even though Jesus is one of the most important people who ever lived, he still served his disciples. And just like Jesus was willing to be last and serve his disciples, we can be willing to be last and serve others. So let's pray, and then you guys can go back to your seats. Dear Jesus, thank you for leaving your throne in heaven to show us how much you love us. Teach us to be servants like you and to love everyone we come in contact with. In your name, amen. All right, thank you guys. You guys can go back to your seat. Good stuff. Thanks, Noel. John chapter 13. Now, this is a, a transitional chapter. Um, Joel, Joel Phillips did a good uh, deep dive that's on our website. It's 10 minutes of just a deeper, uh, deeper biblical uh, study on this. And you got it in your emails yesterday and today if you're getting those. So I'd encourage you to look at that. First 12 chapters of John, the scholars call sort of the book of signs. <clears throat> the rest of John from the 13th chapter on they call the book of glory. So you'll see very, very easily here this sort of transition the beginning, sort of all the things that Jesus has done, sort of the signs of who he is as the Messiah. Now, how, how the glory of God rests upon him and comes through him. <clears throat> there are four characters in the 13th chapter. Now, really more than four, but four that have kind of a, a, a role. It's Passover. Jesus <clears throat> is having his meal. The Gospel of John does not have the Lord's table in it. It has this passage. Jesus is having his meal with the disciples. He has, he stands up as the meal progresses. He takes off his clothes, his outer garments. He is in his, what we would call underwear at, at best, scholars debate how much clothing he had on. He takes a towel and he ties a towel around his waist. And then he starts to bend down and wash the disciples' feet. Now, Noel has said this, and Joel did a good job in the deep dive. <clears throat> Not even Jewish slaves were allowed to wash feet. <laughs> it is so demeaning that only Gentile slaves at the time of Jesus, it was believed, were allowed to actually wash feet. It is seen to be not just, it's just the most degrading thing culturally that could happen. <clears throat> Here Jesus starts to do this, and Peter says, no! You're not going to wash my feet? And Jesus says, hey, if you don't want me to wash your feet, you can't have anything of me. And then Peter says, well, not just my feet, but my head, because Peter's trying to turn it into something that makes it less demeaning, less degrading. Jesus says, no, 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 no. The, the rest is, is clean. I'm washing your feet. <clears throat> then Jesus says these words. So I want you to get your Bibles, chapter 13. Go to verse 12. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you, he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, 
for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Now don't put John away, because the 13th chapter continues. What happens immediately after this is that Jesus predicts his betrayal. And as he predicts his betrayal, Peter wonders, what does this mean? Ask him who's the one that is going to betray. So he goes to John, the writer of the Gospel of John, who always says, the disciple that Jesus loved, right? Very humble guy that he is. He says, he says you're closest to Jesus, ask him who it is. And Jesus says, the one that, that I dip this bread into the cup and I give to will be the one that betrays. And so Jesus does that very quietly. He hands it to Judas. And the Bible says that as Jesus takes that bread, Satan enters into him, and then Judas leaves to go to betray Jesus. Then Jesus says, I give you a new command. Love one another. Love one another. I'm not going to be here forever. I'm, I'm going to go, and I want to leave this command with you. And Peter says, where are you going? I want to go with you. Jesus says, I don't think you do. He says, yes, I do. I'll die for you. And then Jesus looks at Peter, and he says, Peter, before the cock crows three times, today, this morning, you will have denied me three times. Okay? All of that's in the 13th chapter. We'll come back to it in a moment. That's the word of the Lord. <clears throat> we, we've, um, I have been looking at a lot of resumes lately. Uh, we've got positions open in the church, and we're always looking for folks at the center. And uh, just, it's, been, it's been really kind of interesting. And it strikes me that, you know, when you, whether you're looking and putting something online on Indeed or LinkedIn or whatever it is, you have to create a profile, right? You've got to create a, a profile. It's like a, a resume, sort of a, a mini resume, perhaps. And it gets me to start to think about what, <clears throat> what is a profile, really? You know, if you're going to write it or, you know, people that are, that are interested in dating and they do online dating and you have to create a, a dating profile about yourself. I mean, that's intimidating for me to think about, right? I mean, it's like, what would you put in your profile? You know, like, I like pina coladas get caught in the rain, I'm not into health food, I have half a brain. But I could write a song, but, um, but I mean, you start to, start to think about these, what, what do you put in your profile? And here's the real question, right, for me, and this is my, this is my central question today, is, is what you put in your profile really who you are or who you aspire to be, who you want to be? And I would pose to you that whenever we're putting a profile together, no matter what it is, if it's on a, if, you know, if it's on a dating app, if, that, if that's appropriate, if, if, it's in, if it's looking for a job, if it's applying for a school, whatever it is, I would pose to you that almost always we put who we want to be. Are we presented in a way that makes it appear to who we want to be? It, it's aspirational. So here's a question. <clears throat> Is it possible to aspire to be humble? Can you put in your profile, I am the most humble man that ever walked on the face of the earth? <laughs> you know who put that in their profile? Moses. Moses wrote that Moses was the most humble man that ever walked on the earth. I'm not sure that that made Moses humble when he wrote that, right? I mean, it's a really interesting thing. What is humility? What is it to be humble? And can you... Can you, add, can, can you aspire to be humble, or is it egocentric to want to be humble? It's a really great question. I saw just a tiny little clip of Jeff Bezos um, after he got off his spaceship. And, um, and one of the things that he said in, this, in, in the, sort of the press conference, for his like it was 10 minutes in space or something, and, and, and one of the comments that he made was, you know, when you look down and you see earth, you cannot help but be humbled. Now this is the guy that's the most wealthy man on the face of the earth in his own personal spaceship that's talking about being humbled. I mean, there's something odd about that. 
And I'm not being up Jeff Bezos because we all have our personal spaceships. We all kind of have our, our, our reality or, or, or the things that we, that we desire or the things that, that matter. And, and so, so I, I get to this question constantly for myself. Is it, is, it, is it okay to aspire to be humble or is that egocentric if I want to be humble? Is because then that's about me. It's not about... And all of this is because we see humility as an attribute. We see it as something like, you know, well, well, you know, he's just such a humble guy. She's just such a humble woman. She, he's such a loving person. She's such a caring person. And, and, and we, we, we start to think about these as sort of the attributes of who they are. But what if humility had nothing to do with an attribute? And that's really what the story is about today. It's the story of Jesus as he's moving into the chapters on glory to show who he truly is. And the way he does this is so beautiful in the Gospel of John. He begins by emptying himself. He begins by becoming overwhelmingly vulnerable. And let me say this to you. To be naked is the most vulnerable place you can put yourself. Right? I mean, how many of you have ever dreamed, had a dream that, that you, you, know, you, you stood up in front of a classroom to give a presentation or something and you were naked? Right? I mean, I have that dream all the time about standing here. That's why the pulpit is up this high. <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 I mean, it's because, because what that is, is it's, it's, not, it's not really, it's, it's not a weird dream. It's actually about this thought about being vulnerable, about, about being exposed, about being embarrassed. And so that's what Jesus does. He, he strips himself. He, he becomes, he presents and represents before his disciples the most vulnerable position that someone can take. Not only does he strip himself and put just a loincloth perhaps on, but he gets down low enough to wash their feet. And he does something that the culture would continually and, and overwhelmingly reject for anyone, even, even a slave that was a Jew. And he starts to wash. And what we come to realize is that in the story, humility is not an attribute of Jesus. It's a stripping. It's an action of Jesus. It's not that humility is in Jesus, but it's through Jesus. And the true character of God is found not in attributes, but in actions. You see, we spend too much time. we, We send people off to seminary and we mess them up. Because what we do so very often, and I'm an advocate for seminary, and don't. But here's what we so often do is we start to give them all these classes. You know, take a couple of Bible things, and then take theology, and then take philosophy, and then and start to think about the attributes of God, and God is omniscient, and, and omnipresent, and, and, you know, and all these kinds of things. And we start to just start then to focus on sort of the attributes of who this God is, rather than start to to look and realize that the true character of God is found in in what God does. Martin Luther always said that the two places where the greatest power of God were ever shown were also the places of greatest humility. The cradle and the cross. A crying, defenseless, needy baby and a man being executed publicly for a crime he didn't commit. But that's the power. And so when we go back to John, we start to realize that it's not just Jesus washing the disciples' feet, as powerful as that is. It's the entire story of that night. Because what's connected to Jesus washing their feet is Judas betraying him and Peter denying him. All of that is built in. And this understanding of betrayal You know, Dante in the Divine Comedy, he has these sort of rings of of hell. You know who's at the lowest ring of hell? It's always the traitors for him. Dante abhorred the traitors, the ones that betrayed. Those were the ones that were the, 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 the scurrilous people of the earth. These are the ones that, that, that should be rejected, the ones that deserve what they receive, all of those kinds of things that people believe. And that's built into the story. Because what we find is that when we look at Judas and his his betrayal and we look at Peter and his denial, we realize that this is really the ultimate humility. Jesus will not allow that wound of being betrayed and denied to shape his life. He won't allow it to define himself. 
Grace in the Gospel of John is not avoiding vengeance. It's giving good to the undeserved. And this is amazingly powerful when we start to think about this. It's not just, hey, we get down and we we do something that's that's humbling to us, that, that, that is washing someone's feet. What Jesus says, he says, love one another. What I have shown you, love one another. The definition of love is not just to wash someone's feet, but it's to wash your betrayer's feet. And it's to stay connected and to desire nothing but good for them, to die for them, not to reject them, but but to claim them. That's why the Gospel of John ends with Peter being restored with Jesus. It's this amazing thing. And then you start to ask about humility. Oh, it's not just to do something like wash your feet. It's to decide that the wounds that have been inflicted upon me physically, spiritually, emotionally will not define me. And not only will they not define me, but they will not deter me from loving the person that treated me, the one that rejected me, the one that betrayed me. This is humility. You see, when we want to be humble, we can't write inside our own spaceship. We've got to act. We've got to act for another. We've got to be called to death to self. Not wanting, not desiring anything for ourselves, but living fully for the lives of others, even those who spurn us, and refusing to be defined by our wounds. You know, as I look at the world, well, let me start that over. Forget those words. As I look at my life, the places of greatest pain in my life are always connected to the wounds. They're always. They're always connected to the things that happened to me. They're always connected to the ways that I responded when the things happened to me. They're always drawn back to the wounds. And I believe this is why the Gospel of John begins his book on glory with the most obvious wounds that Jesus experienced. Um, Marian Anderson was by many believed to be <clears throat> the most beautiful voice of the 20th century. She sang opera, she sang spirituals, she had an amazingly interesting life. Um, African American kid growing up in Philly, her dad died in a work accident when he was 12. They had to move in with her grandparents. <clears throat> she, um, she grew up overwhelmingly poor. She applied to schools and was denied admission in the 20s and 30s uh, schools because she was black. She continued to move forward. She actually had an opportunity at one point when she could go to Europe, and Europe was actually where she, in a sense, gained her confidence. She came back. Um, The Daughters of the American Revolution, 1940, I think, refused to allow her to sing in Constitution Hall because it was an interracial gathering. So Eleanor Roosevelt and Franklin Roosevelt coordinated a concert for her on an Easter Sunday 75,000 people came, all different backgrounds and races. She actually sang at the March on Washington in 1963. So a reporter, towards the end of her life, asked her what was the most significant moment in her career? What was the one event, the one thing that was more important to her than anything else. You know how she answered? She said it was the day that I went home and I told my mama she didn't have to take in laundry anymore.
There are accolades to be had. There are names to be made. I'll let the world define that. But I want to say for us, as the followers of Jesus, the only thing that he asks for us is to become vulnerable, to get down on our knees, and not just wash someone's feet, but to literally desire nothing but good for the ones that have created the wounds themselves. This is who our God is. And this is who he calls us to be. If we live this, the world is changed in a moment. Retaliation ends and grace begins. It's not just avoiding vengeance. It's giving good to the undeserved. That's why I know that my salvation is secure. As undeserving as I am. Amen. Amen. As we move into a time of reflection on God's word for us and into a time of responding, I encourage you to uh, prepare your tithes and offerings. If you're here in the sanctuary, just put those in the envelope that you received earlier uh, before the service began and leave your envelope on your pew. If you are online, we encourage you to, to find uh, the giving online uh, button and and give in that way or you can use text to give and that number is 757-530-5683 you um, type in the amount you would like to give and send that text and it will walk you through the giving process so let us continue to give of our tithes and additional offerings as we as we lift our god jesus on high Thank you.
As we bow down, Lord, we lift you up. And so we pray, Lord, that you would use these gifts, these opportunities to expand your kingdom. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Christian, in whom do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven. study and um, one of our members, a guy named Dave Schaefer, came in and um, he, uh, he stood at the desk and proceeded to um, give me a lot of opinion and it didn't go real well for me and I responded and um, he left abruptly and um, you know sometimes those things are really hard especially when you think you're right, right? Um, so um, I'm sitting there stewing in my own resentments, marinating in them as Ann Godwin would say. And um, about 10 minutes later, he comes back and he stands at the door. He says, okay, I want to do this over. You're too important to me for this to end the way it ended. And I don't need to resolve anything. I just need to let you know that. Dave Schaefer one of the first men in my life that I knew at that moment loved me. 
I really wonder if instead of allowing the wounds to get us to marinate in our own resentments, if we went back and knocked on a door, not even to resolve a debate, but simply to say, you're too important to me to walk away. What would that do? I believe it would bring Jesus. So I live simply, love generously, serve faithfully, Speak truthfully, pray daily. Leave everything to the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And don't aspire to the attribute of humility, my friends. Simply wash someone's feet and start with someone who has wounded you in your prayers. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.